My name is Saro, Saro Jahani. I'm uh, the CIO of uh, Direct Edge. I was almost about to say National Stock Exchange. That's where I used to work. <laughs> However, I have some colleagues from National and it makes me very happy because they hopefully would share basically this experience with me. We went through this once before together. Uh, the name of this presentation is a model IT for, for a model exchange. Um, most of you, I guess, are, are quite familiar with, with uh, Coverity as such, and you know the, the, the reasons for why Coverity is being used. So the idea here really is to give a little bit of a, my, my vision, my, 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 my picture on um, why, why tools like Coverity are going to be instrumental for, for, for a model IT in other words, to build a model exchange. So I've looked at this not from the perspective of explaining to you what Coverity does or doesn't, but why Coverity or tools like Coverity would be instrumental to build a, a good exchange, especially within the financial industry. So uh, just a little bit about uh, <coughs> DirectEdge. Uh, DirectEdge is basically uh, you know, headquarters in, in, in New Jersey. Uh, this is a, one of the, the youngest exchange, actually, actually e equities exchange in, in U.S. Uh, it is owned by a consortium of, of uh, few broker dealers: uh, Goldman, uh, Citadel, J.P. Morgan, Knight Securities, but also International Stock Exchange. And um, the, the we believe that that. Uh, by the way, it's important to mention that that uh, we don't consider DirectEdge to be an exchange. Uh, DirectEdge is an exchange operator, because we actually have two exchanges, AJ and AJX. So we consider ourselves being an exchange operator. Uh, we work a lot with with product development, but also uh, pricing is is a very important component of our innovation. We believe that that by having two exchanges, it actually gives us or it makes us uh, innovational from a pricing perspective. Uh, I'm not going to go deep down in terms of the type of uh, tools that we're using or the type of uh, you know, the, the functionalities that we provide for the market. But generally speaking, uh, this is an overview on, on what AJ and AJX might be. So generally speaking, AJ is considered to be one of the low-cost exchanges within the United States. Uh, the comparative uh, places that provide this type of pricing, one of them is Boston Stock Exchange, and next one is actually, um, I guess? Yep. <laughs> so uh, a couple of other exchanges provide this type of uh, low-cost uh, low alternative. So DirectEdge is one of them, and, and Boston is next one. Uh, uh, that being said, uh, BATS also has, uh, you know, an exchange that, that provides BATS, BATS uh, Y, provides, again, once again, uh, low-cost exchange uh, functionalities. Uh, again, you know, the, the, the most important thing here is that just bear in mind that uh, rebate for posting and, and charging for removing liquidity is the name of the game. So that's the way an exchange basically makes money. So let's move forward. Um, as part of our, our uh, basically, uh, product portfolio, no matter what type of order flow we can actually detect from the market or absorb from the market, uh, one thing that is very, very important is actually latency. Latency is a very, very important competitive edge in our industry. So uh, uh, if you look at our numbers, we've been basically working very, very intensively, especially during the last uh, nine months. On, on practically creating a latency roadmap. Now, this is not the fastest in the industry. I want to be the first one to say that. However, latency actually is a, is a cat you can skin a million ways. But uh, this is basically a true representation of our matching latency. And once again, I'm saying matching latency, in other words, order acknowledgement latency. But it's a good representation on where we were basically, you know, say June 2011 versus June uh, or, or uh, May 2012. So we have practically done a great deal of work to, to reduce our latency numbers. And with that, we have an estimation on where we're going within three months versus also one year. The reason I'm showing this picture, it's not because I'm bragging about any of, uh, any of these this results. The most important thing is basically to connect this information with what I'm going to say later on. In other words, the type of tools that we actually are, are using to, to, to gain this type of results. Uh, once again, also in the, in the area of, of message count, uh, it is very important to, to remember that, that exchanges are, 
uh, besides being regulated, they also have to be very self-sufficient in terms of regulating themselves, right? So capacity is really one of the most important areas. You always need to have enough capacity so you can meet the, the, the volatility and, and the, the, the spikes and, and, and basically needs of the future. So um, currently we basically are, are uh, handling our daily message count is around uh, two and a half billion. However, you know, we believe that this number is more than enough going forward, so it's not much effort in terms of improving it, especially looking at that the max observed, basically, which is more or less 408 million. So this way I have good enough capacity. But generally speaking, bear in mind that, that these are areas that we constantly have to look at. Um, the, the exchange uh, has a couple of very, uh, what I would say, instrumental data centers that are part of the financial industry. We have one in, in Secaucus, uh, Equinix NY4, another one in, in Telex in uh, Clifton. Both facilities are in New Jersey. Right now we're working on, on a geographic diversity that basically would move one of these data centers to somewhere else, hopefully CERMAC, uh, 350 East CERMAC in Chicago. And the idea behind this is basically to have geographic diversity because you understand that, that having two data centers too close to each other is not really that appropriate from a, an operational perspective. Now, that being said, please bear in mind that the way industry handles exchanges, their production sites and their disaster recovery requirements are, are quite different. What we call disaster recovery and what the clients see as disaster recovery are two different things. Because as the national market system is a fragmented environment, should basically there be any issue with an exchange, usually the, 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 the broker dealer, the, the, you know, they, they usually route away from an exchange and, and hit the other one. So this way, please bear in mind that, that uh, the geographic diversity is basically an internal issue and more so from a compliance and regulatory perspective. I handle, uh, this is basically the scope of the, the, the data centers that, that uh, with equipment, uh, network nodes, servers, uh, you know, the amount of data that we handle. Uh, basically you know the amount of space that we handle but if you look at the on the right side at the very bottom it says basically 110 and that's really the, the most important thing here i have to run an exchange we have more or less 110 different tools to 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 practically uh, provide for the exchange now this is really good from the perspective that that you know, you, you have the, the option of using so many tools besides the tools that you actually create yourself, but it's also scary because managing 110 tools is, is very difficult. So buying tools is one thing, but actually having a support model to, to sustain that functionality, to maintain uh, the, the good and, 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 and benefits that, that any tool brings to the table is most important. So unless we operationalize a tool, it is not a good, good choice. So with Coverity, especially with Coverity, by looking at static code analysis, one of the things that I was very, very interested in was basically, is this tool something that we can operationalize? In other words, we can create a life cycle behind it. Because if you can't do it, then, then the money's gone. So this way, you know, I just want to institute basically this, this thinking that, that having you know, a few tools or having hundreds of tools is not really a differentiator. The most important differentiator is that the tool is something that you can operationalize. So uh, we, we, uh, the reason I chose to show the, basically this picture is because I strongly distinguish basically the, the infrastructure side from the, the software side. I want to basically emphasize here that, that please understand that infrastructure, it is easier to make a redundant and more resilient uh, infrastructure a, a environment nowadays because it's invested IT. It's something that you can buy. So if you need basically two servers and, and there are enough failover capabilities out there that can help you to, to failover between servers, that capability today can be bought. You can easily go out there and buy good enough infrastructure. You can buy additional lines, you can buy circuits, you can buy uh, enough nodes, network nodes, you can buy services from different vendors. So creating resiliency and diversity is not so difficult nowadays when it comes to infrastructure. And exchanges, generally speaking, they have good enough, what I would say, budget for, for infrastructure to cover those type of costs. However, the important thing here, the important differentiator becomes here all of a sudden the application. Because if you can really deliver, uh, what I would say, resilient application and, and 
your software development methodology is as resilient that uh, is resilient enough to make sure that you actually do enough QA, enough testing, enough proactive testing, so you can basically detect these problems early enough. That is really when, when, it, when it becomes a differentiator. So once again, a little bit about the, the, the engine, the matching engine, you know, the way our clients basically interact with us in terms of using our, our uh, what we call business system interface, which is practically our gateways for, for clients to come in. Once again, I want to reemphasize that all these connections are, are redundant, all this technology is redundant. So this is not where, where basically we worry. Where we worry where, where the application layer kicks in. So um, I want to also highlight here something that is very, very important. So there is a number there, if you can see, it says 4,940. That is the number of changes that I uh, basically uh, executed on during 2011. So if you can look at this way, so we have something like uh, pretty much uh, 200 working days a year. So an exchange that basically is making almost 5,000 changes, right? Just imagine the impact, uh, the risk that you're taking within your production environment. So if you can bring that number down and you can bring that number to, down to a manageable, manageable number, that's when you actually are reducing risk. Because in our area, risk is the most important component. If we can't handle the risk, if we can't manage the risk, especially when we have to live with it all the time, then, then we're in trouble. So that being said, I want to highlight one thing. The, if you look at the very left side, you will see basically my application and software changes. And as you can see, it's almost, almost 1,400 changes that I did on the software side uh, that we did, my apologies, but that we did within um, Direct Edge on the software side. Now, even though when we have two different exchanges, bear in mind that the application changes apply to, to both exchanges. In other words, if I apply a change on, on one exchange, then, then it also goes to the next one. I am basically a, a uh, uh, what I would say, uh, I consider myself being a, an ITIL practitioner. I've not even taken ITIL classes, just so you know. But I love ITIL because I've worked with ITIL many, many years. I see ITIL as an enabler and basically a differentiator. I believe that, that people that worked before my time at DirectEdge, they did a great job. They created an environment that basically was, was uh, very good. However, when, when, uh, when time goes on, right, you know, it gets to a point where we might be, the current state constantly is going to a point where you might be a little bit off target and have some, some wide variations, right? And by idealizing an environment, you have to get to a point where you actually are creating an on-target, basically, facility with, with, with very little variation, and that's really the name of the game. So I have used ITIL many, many years, and, and I intend to continue using it. I believe it helps me, basically. I don't see ITIL as a differentiator, but I definitely see ITIL as an enabler. So uh, the, within Direct Edge, what I have done is that, basically, I have implemented uh, the, the, this, this 10 different disciplines that are used by ITIL. So that we have a configuration, configuration management discipline in place. We have incident management, problem management in place, change management, release management in place, and also the IT service delivery modules are, are mostly in place. The only thing that, that we're working on actually improving is the financial management. So we have the financial management uh, right now introduced to, to Direct Edge within information technology, but we're working on developing that module. Bear in mind that, that the client is the name of the game. Client is the focus. So these are all different type of frameworks that basically are helping us to improve our, our services around client service, around service desk, around improving our, our support and service to our clients, right? Now, in this area, what, what's called release management, right? The release management is a generic, basically, uh, discipline that helps you to, to handle your software, generally speaking, from the moment you basically start developing it, from the moment you start writing requirements all the way into your production environment. But in, it actually does not cover my problems in terms of agility. It doesn't cover my problems in terms of making sure that the software that I actually deliver is stable enough and it's fast enough delivered so that it actually can give me competitive edge. And this is really the name of the game. That's why we're all sitting here. So that being said, I want to distinguish that, that the, the software disciplines, software development disciplines, they really require military precision. In other words, you know, we can't just deliver code and hope that it's going to work. 
the, if you look at dynamic, for instance, testing, you can, and I'm going into software development life cycle, but the idea is not to dif dis discuss software development life cycle here. The idea is to kind of give you a little bit of my vision on what software development life cycle uh, might work today versus how it might, might come out tomorrow, and that's really where I'm going. So uh, this is a traditional picture. This is a slide that, that many of you guys probably know even uh, much better than I do. So as you can see, you know, everything starts with planning, uh, requirement specifications, design, implementation, detailing, you know, going to development and coding, right? And then after that, of course, we're going to do functional testing, you know. Uh, most probably you have done some unit testing before even you get that far. Uh, you know, your QA and regression kicks in and, and so on and so forth till, till you get basically to your deployment. So very simple, right? But guess what? You know, the way basically an exchange operates today is, is very different. Today, uh, exchanges are extremely client driven. You know, every time basically a, a sales representative meets with a client, there is a new requirement. Every day, there is a new requirement coming in, uh, you know, uh, to be compliant. Every day, there is a new requirement to, to be competitive with the market. Every day, there is, there is a new type of, of, of uh, requirement that, that slowly gives birth to a new type of, of order and so on and so forth. So there is no end to this. There is really no end to say, OK, I'm going to take five minutes and, and, and think about something else. There is no such thing. This is a life cycle, and it const constantly is moving. And either you're with it or you're not with it. If you're not with the cycle, then, then you're pretty much out. So the, the competitive edge that I'm talking about, the, the exchanges today, especially based on the, the market volume, and I'm sure many of you know what's going on in the market. Only a couple of years ago, you know, we would be talking about uh, almost 18, sometimes even 20 billion shares a day, right? Nowadays, you know, a good day with six, seven billion shares a day is pretty much a good day, as I call. So um, it is a very, very tough market. Time to market is probably the most important thing. Just having the functionality is good enough, is not good enough. You have to be the first one you have to bring that functionality first out because that's really when, when you absorb new clients. Pricing and all that stuff is very, very important, but more so the aspect of uh, stability of an exchange, the aspect of latency, your, your order acknowledgement latency, and now there's even uh, the, the, the feeds that you provide, the depth of book feed, the top of book feed, attributed feed, and so on and so forth. These are all basically type of products that you introduce to the market. If they're not fast enough, it's not going to work. That being said, Bear in mind that time to market is probably the most important component, and we have to respect that. However, what we have done is that this is really a little bit of my vision in terms of how I should basically run my IT shop. Uh, what I see is basically uh, multiple scenarios, and I'm going to get to it, but, but an exchange, generally speaking, or any exchange actually, they have two areas where there is really no compromises. One of them is regulatory and compliance, and next one is basically you know, the stability. In other words, you cannot have service disruptions. These two areas are more or less uh, a, a sacred cow, and they actually is a zero tolerance. So when you do your risk management spectrum, right, and you look at different areas such as the culture of the organization, the compliance needs, regulatory needs, technology needs, and so on and so forth, your data centers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When it comes to basically focus on, on compliance, regulatory, and, and, and service disruptions, there is really no, no tolerance. When you're basically out of the market, that's when you lose money. And in an exchange environment, you're always as good as your last failure. In other words, if you failed yesterday, that's how people remember you. Now, one of the best performing exchanges uh, uh, bats, and many of us know them, uh, basically remember uh, they had an incident just uh, quite recently, and unfortunately it's going to be there for the rest of their lives. So no matter how we look at it, they will be always remembered, right? So they have to work now. They worked multiple years to gain a great deal of respect, and now basically you have to work again and harder and harder to regain that respect, right? That being said, What's important here is that <clears throat> in an exchange environment, basically, you have to focus. You have to create certain type of focus that helps you to identify your issues as early as possible. Generally speaking, in our lives, we, there, is, there are always situations when we know something, right? We know that we know. When you know something, 
that you know, that, that's a good thing, right? You're, it's, it's awareness. Sometimes you know that you don't know. When you, don't know, when you know that you don't know, then, then you avoid that problem, right? That's also great. And sometimes you don't know that you know. That's actually also good because it's a positive surprise. But for us in the software industry, the most important thing is don't know, don't know areas. And that's the killer. So how do we get to a point where we can actually identify don't know, don't knows? That is really where basically coverity is an important basically topic for, for direct edge. So with that focus on mind, um, we have uh, also added a new component to this. We used to deliver software, and, and this is a little bit in, in regards to your question a few minutes ago. We used to deliver software pretty much sporadically, depending on the number of requirements that we had included. If the, the magnitude of requirements was, was uh, large, right, then, then we would probably deliver software every six months, sometimes every seven months probably. And sometimes it would take even longer time and so on and so forth. Because we were thinking in a waterfall, what I would say, mindset, right? So till the requirements would be you know, formulated properly, till they would be uh, you know, designed and, and prepped properly, till they would basically get into coding. And coding would be basically following all those tickets in order to get it out into QA and so on and so forth, and back and forth, back and forth. That basically would take a great deal of time. And most of the time, we had to restart again because in between, there was all of a sudden a new client that actually came out with a new requirement. And guess what? Now we're actually adding more, right? So with one hand, we would create a freeze, right? Not to add more clients, not, excuse me, not to add more, more requirements. And then two days later, business development would come in. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and all of a sudden, you had a new requirement added, whether you like it or not, because it's client driven. It is market driven, and so on and so forth. So it's not really much about discussing which is right, what's, what's right, what's wrong. The, the, we have to deal with this re reality. In order to do so, we introduced something called Agile. Agile is our version of, of Agile, in other words, rapid application development. So what we have done, we basically uh, uh, put out a goal, and we said that in this area, we have to be able to, to deliver uh, every four to six weeks we have to deliver new code. We have to deliver into production, and we have two exchanges, remember. So we have to release code into production. So say every end of, every, say end of May, May, end of April, and so on and so forth. But two weeks in a row, two weekends in a row, we have to release new code. So this all of a sudden becomes quite, quite um, a dramatic difference, right, you know, compared to every six months. So with that topic on mind, with that goal on mind, we actually introduced this. And as a matter of fact, today, we actually are delivering software every four to five weeks. So it actually has given very good results. Now, that being said, it doesn't mean that, that we have 100% success ratio. But we are very close, and, and that's really what I want to talk about. So what we did there is that, uh, I'm sorry. Um, we created a structure around this. This is just a picture that I took uh, directly out of my own archive. And, and we created basically what we call different type of uh, scrum teams. In other words, if you're familiar with rugby, then, then you understand, and, and most of you, I'm sure, you understand uh, development uh, quite well. So basically what happens is that we created in, the, in, the, uh, in our core matching area, we, we created a core dedicated agile team, scrum team. In the area of our, our uh, basically uh, our routing engine, we also, smart order routing, we created another group of, of uh, scrum team. In the area of our back office online development, we created another scrum team, and so on and so forth. So every area where we actually could identify where we could be better, faster, and so on and so forth, we created basically this modular thinking. We assigned this to dedicated development, product management, as well as QA people, and created basically the team that, that has to work together in order to go through this two-week cycles. So with this, we more than anything reduce the amount of, of what I would say requirements that apply to each and every one of the group. In other words, in proper English, I would say we cut the elephant into pieces, right? So that being said, we also made sure that they actually each and every one of the developers is equipped with the, with the right type of tools. So when, when you want to do something like this, <clears throat> the first and, and foremost important question that comes to mind is, is this really doable? And believe me, it is very, very difficult. This is a very, very important cultural distinction. Uh, developers have a very strong say. 
And we have to always remember, development people, generally speaking, are very, very creative people. So let's not only look at the, the ability to code. They have always an opinion, and, and we have to respect that. So if we just assume that, that it's going to happen by, by somebody, the CIO or CTO, telling them, go get it done, it's not going to happen. Because each and every one has an opinion about what's right and wrong. And in order to get them to actually cohesively work with, with the same goal in mind, you actually have to provide an environment that really is, is, is uh, appealing to them. So if you give them a tool that is not working well, you're shooting yourself in your own foot. So the tool has to work. And, and if the tool works, the tool only works if they believe it works. If they don't believe it works, it doesn't work because they will not follow it. And if they don't do it, it's not going to work, right? So cohesive, basically this cohesiveness that really is very, very instrumental, it literally has to be properly studied. The, it is not a, a tool that you basically, this type of tools, you can't just ask people to use it. You have to make them come and ask for it. You have to make them like it. And th th that's why, for instance, you know, I learned from my previous example, from my previous ex experience in, in, in introducing uh, uh, covertity, you know, in, our, uh, in my previous uh, uh, workplace. And I remember the type of problems that, that we faced then and the, the type of discussions we had then and so on and so forth. So I actually capitalized on that, on that experience and tried not to copy those problems again. And this was very, very important. In other words, what I did here is that I actually uh, sat back and I literally looked at you know, the, the areas that I really wanted to, to, to basically attack. And I realized basically that, that uh, you know, the product management the, the, the coding itself and, and, and more so uh, unit testing, functional testing, and all these things are components that actually you know, play into this tool. In other words, they actually have to, the cohesiveness that I'm talking about, it actually has to be incorporated in your thoughts and you have to demonstrate that. So the first thing that I did is that I actually did not start with covertity. I did not start with any static code analysis tool at all. I actually, first of all, attacked my regression environment because Regression is basically an environment where you make sure that your software is backwards compatible, right? Now, why am I talking about this topic here? It's because uh, if you can remember that, that curve that I just showed with regards to risks, right? The idea behind static code analysis, the idea behind this type of agile methodology and so on and so forth, they will all fall and they will all fail if you really don't look at it from proactive perspective. The idea is to attack and identify the risks as early as possible. Now, that being said, Coverty will help you, and Coverty, uh, you know, development testing will help you definitely to, to attack that problem. But the backwards compatibility that you have, right, that you have to actually uh, kind of uh, face going forward by testing, regression testing, and so on and so forth, those elements, those components don't go away. So, that had to be fixed. In other words, instead of going covertly and attacking development and attacking development-related issues, I actually first fixed my, my QA environment. Um, I brought in something called, not interesting here, but, but a, a tool that, that helped me to automate my regression environment. I created a multi-threaded uh, regression environment so I could basically do modular testing. I could do modular regression testing and I could do a multi-threaded version of it, right? Because what happens is that without a regression and, and, and testing functionally working and, and performing well, the, the effort to introduce any type of static code analysis will fail. So I'm not saying that that's a dependency that everybody should have, but I'm saying that we have to study our, our processes well before we actually go there. So I looked at basically the, the, the number of test cases that I needed Right? Once again, remember, the, the most important component here is risk. I uh, basically looked at other exchanges and I spoke to other people and, and, and people that, that had worked with me before and I identified certain basically criteria. I looked at it from the perspective of, say that you know, an exchange or a financial trading environment requires basically, say, uh, handling uh, trading with, with low risk, right? If you just look at the low risk. Then I realized that, that you need at least for an exchange like ours, we need something like 300,000 test cases 
in order to be able to, to practically say that, okay, all these test cases are executed properly and we end up having basically a low risk environment. If you're going a medium, we, we're talking about for an environment like ours again, something like 30 to 50,000 test cases. And when we're talking about high risks, we're actually talking about 12 to 15,000 test cases. Now, let's ask ourselves the, the most important question. How many exchanges do we believe that are actually executing with this many uh, test cases? And there are experts here. So I would assume that, that you know, exchanges operate either with, with 10, 12,000 test cases or below which literally means that, that every exchange would operate in ultra high, actually, risk territory. And the idea is actually to control the risk, right? So this becomes actually quite an issue. So how do we basically make sure that, that we have, you know, a ultra high risk environment, but still deliver software with good quality and, and, and stability and, and reduce service disruption and, and business disruption more so? right? And stay compliant with the industry. That's really the name of the game. So for that, you need to detect your problems as early as possible. In order to run 300 test cases, 300,000 test cases in a regression environment, no matter how multi-threaded it is, believe me, you will need weeks of, 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 of regression time, at least. And it's not going to happen. Right now, I'm running something like, say, between 12 and 15,000 test cases. In serial mode, in serial mode, in other words, with no multi-threaded, basically, engines, I end up going another 72 hours in order to finish one full regression, right? So here you see the need for the scrums. Here you see the need for modular development. Here you see the need that you have to cut the elephant into pieces, and so on and so forth. So having multi-threaded environment, having multi-engine environment, having basically risk detection as early as possible becomes basically very, very instrumental for, for your to be or not to be within the industry. That being said, uh, what I also want to add is that, you know, generally speaking, one of the most classic things that, that we, happens within development, and it has happened to me personally quite a few times, is that, you know, what happens is that there is a bug, right? We immediately create a patch, we test it, we QA it, we regress it, and we push it in. That's, that's pretty much the classic. I would assume that, that many of us face that, right? But how do we basically imagine with the type of orders that, that basically are moved around within the industry, right? Multiple type of orders, order types, the better word. Um, you know, multiple permutations of, of, of order types, uh, you know, different parameters, uh, you know, the timing of the orders race cases that, that occurs within the market and so on and so forth. And you will all of a sudden see that, that there are millions and millions of permutations out there, if not more, right? So how do you control this in a, in a dynamic testing environment? You fix the code, you fix the bug, you uh, release a patch, you put it out, it works today, one month later, all of a sudden the problem occurs. It becomes a whack-a-mole. So one way or another, the problem basically pops up again. I find sometimes problems with code that were introduced three years ago, four years ago. So how can I basically say that, that when was this really born? The problem is born today or it was born basically three, four years ago? So these are all very, very important components. So that is why static code analysis basically is very, very important because static code analysis, the idea behind this is to basically make sure that, that we have a complementary capability to, uh, to, to, to actually detect these problems as early as possible that we have areas that, that we can actually help our source code, right? That we can change basically the paths and, and, and identify these problems and detect the erroneous issues as soon as possible. And with that, you know, based on the knowledge that I had from, from my previous experiences, based on the knowledge that I gathered by, by talking to different people, even then, I did not say that we got to go covertly. What I said is that we have to start with basically what I call proof of concept. So we started evaluating. We created the test scenario, actually chose one of the scrums, and said, OK, everybody else is going to work the traditional way, and one of them, basically, one of the scrums is going to go the, the, the covertly way. And let's basically com you know, uh, compare the, resu the, the result. The outcome was basically that, that, uh, that the code that was delivered, it was very, very interesting. We created, we, they were, we identified uh, 531, and this is only one scrum, remember, one scrum. Right? In other words, two weeks of work. 
And it was very, very <laughs> dramatic, at least to me. We basically identified 531 problems. We uh, inspected uh, as, many of we, uh, as many of them as we could. And already, you know, when we inspected 504 of them, I already had, had answers for, for uh, 465 of them. I knew that basically they could be, you know, uh, what I would say, false positives and so on and so forth. But fact was the same. We actually had 83 different issues. So imagine, right, you know, 83 di if different issues compared to 531 total that you actually have identified, right? So there is a problem. There is a problem. And this is basically not anymore what I like or I don't like. Not anymore what the developer wants or doesn't want. What basically was done here was done by the developers themselves. They identified it. They came back with this, this, this result. It was their baby. And this was really the, the, the most important you know, distinguishing fact. So this entire game was played by the development team, by the scrum team, by the QA team, by the product management that was actually involved and, was, and also project management that was actually project managing that, that, that scrum. And we came up with these results. With that in mind, we basically, even then, agreed that, that this type of tools has to be phased in. In other words, we created a strategy around how we're going to basically phase in this tool. We did not say, OK, as soon as it works, give it to everybody, get it started, and so on and so forth. But the result was constantly, constantly replayed in other scrums, in upcoming scrums, as well as basically in other initiatives that was probably even following the older waterfall methodology. But we did basically demonstrate that, that this is a tool that, that can help us a lot. And this tool basically is going to give us the, the capabilities that we need to detect our risks, our problems, as early as possible. With that in mind, we also went into a training and partnership program with Coverity. Believe it or not, when we started a few years ago, there was actually a partnership program with, with Coverity. And I liked it a lot. So I actually recalled that. And I said, this is what I want. Now, Interestingly, Coverity was, was uh, interested in that again, and we actually resurrected that model. And as a matter of fact, we're actually going through a, a training and partnership program. This has been very, very helpful. It actually has also helped us from the perspective of sharing you know, ideas with Coverity. We've been able actually to share. So I have been able to visit Coverity in California. I've been able to share with them my vision about reducing the impact of QA, not eliminating, reducing the impact of QA and making QA more proactive and, and, and coming up with a model that really helps us to deliver code both faster but also uh, incorporated with development. In other words, they actually are, are multitasking right now. Uh, we immediately basically uh, identified the, the different areas of our software development steps, identified the tools that we were using, but also identified where Coverity would fit in. And, and as you can see, static code analysis became basically is one of our, our, our most important steps in our, in our life cycle. Now, this gets replayed day in and day out on a daily basis with, with the, the, the scrum teams that we actually have in place. So every morning, the development basically group comes in, QA comes in, product management, and so on. All these guys get together in, in, in the agile room that they have, right? And, and practically look at the, 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 their, their uh, requirements that they have worked on and look at the additional requirements that are in, right? And with that, basically, you know, we constantly run through the coding as well as, you know, running it through the coverity, identifying the, the, the text, uh, triaging them, coming up whether or not we should basically, you know, handle them, should we exclude them, should we basically fix them, and so on and so forth. So it's a constant, what I would say, process. But the fact that at the end of every day, we can actually come up with, with, with what needs to be done for tomorrow in terms of coding and what's right and wrong, that actually is a very, very helpful uh, methodology. Uh, once again, you know, we created some, some, some controls in order to make sure that we have uh, very verification milestone, milestones in terms of, you know, kind of stopping toll gates and, and, and looking at what, what needs to be done was instituted. And with that, basically today, we have made Coverity, as, as I would call it, uh, and, and uh, we have, we, have, we have made it actually part of our life cycle. I believe the life cycle in this is, is the most important topic. And, and uh, I think if you look at, if you kind of 
uh, think about the, the presentation. I did not mention too much about uh, you know, uh, how Coverity works and so on and so forth because I believe that there are experts in this room that can answer that, qu those questions much better than I do. Uh, what I'm showcasing here really is the need. What I'm showcasing here is how we can basically make some, a tool like this or, or, or a, an environment like this, uh, say, you know, at least a, a subject for success rather than, than a subject for failure. So with that in mind, I'm opening up for any questions that you have and hopefully I will be able to answer them. Hot fixes are hot fixes, right? Is you don't have much time to, to, to deal with that, yeah. right? So it's an exception handling, right? Okay. It definitely is an exception handling. But the beauty of the, the, this is basically that, that we have a little bit of room there for, 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 for hot fixes and, and what I would say uh, extraordinary situation and it actually doesn't need to be a hot fix. I mean sometimes we actually get requirements right on the fly and, and you have no choice but dealing with that. So that is handled by, by a quick scrum team and usually is handled that way. But more so please bear in mind the regression topic that I brought up that still plays in very very you know important. But in this case I'm not running a full regression. We actually are, are talking to Coverity to, to make sure that we, we get um, a tool that is going to help us more so also from information security perspective. That is really one of the most important topics. So I have right now my information security officer speaking with Coverity and, and coming up with, with what we can do there. We also believe that, that there are some, some, some very interesting administration tools that basically reporting tools and stuff that, that gives us management reports and so on and so forth. We're using Greenline Verifix. Yes, so I have practically, you know, pushed it out through the entire QA environment. Uh, we looked at Verifix, we looked at Magnifix, we looked at Certifix, we looked at other fixes as well on the site. But, <laughs> but the one that, that, that was very, very appropriate for us was, was uh, Verifix. One of the most common things that would happen, and you're actually ha asking a very important question here, because when you create this type of scrums and you want them to use Coverity, right? You're forcing QA to actually use, say, Coverity. The, the, the classic situation is that your developers usually are not using Verifix. They're using their own tools to do unit testing and that type of stuff, right? So usually what happens is that if the test is very successful, they do a, a what I would say, a non-Verifix version of it. And now you have a developer that gives you a test case, and then you need to go back to your QA and say, recreate the same test, ca test case, all doing Verifix. So you're doing the same job twice, right? So what I've done now is that I push that Verifix also on the development side. So the developers that are doing, and we have a couple of developers that are very good at unit testing. They're really not developers, even though when they're working within development, but they actually are working within those scrums, and they do unit testing. So even the unit testings are now uh, basic. As much as possible, bear in mind, uh, you know, you can probably do 90, 95% uh, you know, in very fixed, but there is always some manual testing on the side. But anything that can be very fixed is very fixed. You know. What I follow here is uh, the, the, the high risk. Because I need to cut down on, uh, the gentleman over there asked a, a very interesting question, right? So if I have 300,000 test cases and I have a hotfix situation, there's almost no chance for me to, to, to do the regression, right? So I can only handle so much. Now, it's a multi-threaded regression environment. It's a multi, let's say, multi-threaded uh, multi and, and uh, modular. In other words, I can run smaller tracks of, of regression. But it, again, it takes hours and sometimes even a, an entire night to regress, right? So for hot fixes, there's no way to run 300,000 test cases or 30,000 or 50,000 test cases. As a matter of fact, I know that, that none of the exchanges, especially within the U.S. US uh, equities market, applies this type of numbers. And everyone knows that it's impossible. It's so the most common thing that usually happens within testing, if you don't have an exceptional situation such as uh, hot fixes, is that you usually, you know, basically, you know, develop the code, run through your, your system's development lifecycle, but instead of uh, letting it go into your production, you release it in your staging environment or your disaster recovery environment and, and basically run performance testing. And by the scrums, they kind of, you know, day after day, you know, there's always a bunches of, 
of, of a batch of, of code that needs to be rechecked the day after. So you know the developer constantly is checking and, and providing new code that goes through the same cycle day after day. I would say that, that right now, right now, we're actually in a, a 90-10 situation. We actually started with 80-20, believe it or not. We are 90-10, and it's getting better and better. Because basically, you know, now I've been using uh, this type of tools for quite some time, so they're getting better and better. The result just gets better and better. But there is no such thing called 100%. I want to be the first one to say that. Yes. Uh, I used Coverity at, at my previous workplace, National Stock Exchange. However, at this place, I've used it for, for one year. So before I pushed it out to the development uh, desktops or developer desktops, I started with, with nightly batches. And I still do the nightly batches as well. But interestingly, the fact that we're pushing it out to the developers, it's actually helping us to, to reduce the pressure on the night batch. So, yes. While we actually talk about you know, peer reviews and extra pair of eyes and all this stuff, the fact that the developer has, an, has a chance to, to re-review his own code, right, her own code, and, and based on facts that he reads, right, that he sees, and, and creates libraries for, right? So some of the false, false, uh, you know, uh, false positives, they, they come back. Every now and then they come back. So more you use Coverity, better it becomes, because it, it becomes more and more intelligent. You create, basically, you, know, you identify the false, false positives, and you basically push them on the site. And every time it comes up, you can actually immediately correlate that.